Okay, so now we will do uh, momentum based gradient descent. Okay, in this module we will uh, look at momentum based gradient descent. So, what were the observations about gradient descent that it takes a lot of time to navigate regions having a gentle slope. So, what is the practical impl impl uh, implication of this? In practice, right, what does this lead to? What does this mean? Right, it takes more time. So, remember we had said this max iteration is equal to 1000. Now, if your initialization, ha initialization happens to be such that you are stuck in this large flat region, then those 1000 iterations you just keep moving around that flat region, right? You will not enter into one of the valleys. And valleys is what you are interested in, right? Because valleys is where you will have some minima for your function, right? So, if you have a very, very gentle slope, then for 1000 iterations you will keep moving around that gentle slope, right? That is why this has a practical implication. Now, this was because the gradient in this regions was small. Can we do something better? That is the question, right? So, yes, we can and we will take a look at momentum based gradient descent, okay? So, here is the analogy which I give. Uh, my TAs have heard this uh, at least 10 times. So, I will just repeat it the 11th time for them. So, I hope that is the one which I want to use here. Yeah. Okay. So, now suppose you are uh, standing at the Vela Cherry Gate and you want to go to Phoenix Market City, something that all of you can relate to today. So, you want to go to Phoenix Market City and you ask the security guy at the gate that where do I go? Right. So, he will say take a left. No, take a right. So, I am slightly dyslexic actually I have a left right dyslexia. So, take uh, take a right. Okay. So, you will say okay he has told me to move a right but you would still be a bit cautious right. You will just keep moving slowly in that direction. Right? That is how we find ask for directions. You keep moving slowly in that direction. Right? Now, 100 steps later or 100 meters later you find another guy and you ask him or her where is Phoenix Market City. He again points to you in the same direction keep moving left right uh, right okay so now you'll what will happen you'll increase your pace okay and then you ask again someone when you reach the signal where it is and he again points you in that direction what will happen it'll move even faster right so what is happening here if a lot of people are pointing you in the same direction you better start taking larger and larger steps in that direction does that make sense that's how we find directions and move around okay so just like a ball gains momentum as it goes down a slope, right? It's constantly moving in that direction, so it starts moving faster. So now, can you tell me a way of incorporating this? I've been moving in a certain direction. These directions are nothing but the gradients, right? And now, at this point, someone asks me again to move in the same direction. What should I do? Take a bigger step. So can you think or try to imagine how would you do this mathematically? Okay. Okay. So it's probably there are a few ways to do it. So let's see. So what I'm doing here is, this is my current gradient, right? So I asked that guy at the signal. He asked me to move in that direction. So that's this direction, and this is all my history. Whatever I did till step t minus one. Okay. So now what I'll do is, I will. So earlier I was moving like this. This is what my update rule was w t plus 1 is equal to w t minus in the direction of the gradient, right? I was moving in the direction opposite to the gradient. Now, what I have is in addition to that, I have this gamma update t minus 1. So, that means whatever I had done up till step t minus 1, I will also take that into account. So, I will end up taking a larger step. Is that clear? If it is not clear, it will become clear on the next slide. But is it clear? Okay, so let's see what this means, right? So uh, it basically means that in addition to the current step, also look at the history. There are three guys who earlier pointed you in the same direction, so maybe this direction makes sense, right? So start accumulating that and move faster. Okay, so let's just break this down and see, right? So this is what the update rule is. Okay, uh, sorry, this is all my updates and this is the update rule. So at time step zero, uh, my update is zero because it was not started yet. At time step 1, this is what it will look like, right? And this is nothing but just move in the direction of the opposite to the gradient because this minus sign will come later on, right, in the next equation. Is it clear so far? Okay. Now, what will happen? Update 2. 
So it's gamma times update one plus the gradient at the current step. So remember here everything is positive. I'm adding the gradients because my final negative sign is going to come in the next equation. Okay, so don't get confused with that. Okay, eventually I'm going to move in the direction opposite. That opposite will come from this negative sign. Okay, so what is happening? I am moving in the current direction plus a fraction of the direction which was pointed earlier. Right? Okay, then does this make sense? So can you tell me in general what is happening here at the tth time step what is happening? What kind of average am I taking? Weighted average but it's a dash weighted average. This is an exponentially weighted average. Okay, so let's look at this right. So when I am at step 4, I have most faith in the current gradient, right? And this gamma is always, I'll just set it to less something less than 1, right? So I have a fractional uh, trust in the previous gradient, even smaller trust in the previous guy, and even smaller trust in the previous guy. So I'm taking an average of all my gradients, but it's an exponentially weighted average. Does that make sense? Okay, my maximum faith lies in the current guy, and then decaying faith in the previous guys. Okay, and as I move further and further away from the last guy that I checked, right, I'll give lesser and lesser weightage to that. So everyone understands what is happening here? Anyone who has a problem with this? Just raise your hands if you understand this. Okay, good. So in general, this is going to be the formula. And you see that as, uh, is there a problem here? No. As t is larger, this fraction is going to become smaller and smaller, right? So your first the first step that you take will have lesser and lesser weightage as t increases. Everyone gets this? Okay, fine. So now this is the code for momentum based gradient descent. Uh, I'll just give you a minute to stare at the code and see if it makes sense. So this much part is okay, you're just computing the gradients with respect to all the points, right? And now we are keeping this running sum, okay, which is the previous gradients and the current gradient, right? And then you're just subtracting that running sum. Is that clear? Everyone gets the code? Okay. Now this sorry looking black curve that you see here, that is gradient this, this guy. Okay. This black curve that you see here, that's gradient descent when I have run it for around 100 iterations. Okay. Now I'm going to run momentum based gradient descent and each click is going to be one step. Okay, and I want you to observe what happens. Okay, so slowly a red curve will start appearing on the figure. Initially, it will not be visible, so don't worry. There's nothing wrong with your eyesight. One. How many of you already see the red part? Okay, I see it. Two, three, four, five, six. No, now you can see it. There's nothing great about it. Seven, eight, nine. I want you to observe something here. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, came back, right? So gradient descent, I ran it for 100 iterations. It was just stuck here, right? This was a point at the, and I ran this for less than like around 15 or 20 is what we counted, right? And it's already entered into the value, right? So momentum based gradient descent is good. You see that wicked smile on my face. And you know it's a trick question. Okay, so we are moving fast, right? Even in the regions where the slope was gentle, right? That's the beginning of the uh, beginning of our trajectory, right? This was a gentle region. Even that, I was very quickly able to navigate, right? Within five to six steps, I was away from that part, right? So even in the regions where the slope was gentle, I was able to move fast. But is moving fast always good? Philosophical question, <laughs> right? So would there be a situation where momentum would cause us to run past the goal? Same thing, now instead of walking, you are in a car. You ask the person at the security whether I should go there. He says yes, go in the right direction, you keep moving there. Someone else, you keep accelerating. What will happen eventually? You'll go past Phoenix Market City. Then what will you do? Take a U-turn, come back. Again while taking a U-turn, what will you do? Overshoot and come to the signal and then go back again, right? 
So you see this, you'll end up taking a lot of U-turns. So let us change the input data a bit and see what happens to momentum based gradient descent. Okay. So this is what my data looks like now. Uh, so this is not what my data looks like. This is what my error surface looks like. So earlier we had this error surface, something like a flying carpet. Now I have a very peculiar error surface. This is again for the two parameter problem, right? W comma B. That means I want to learn a sigmoid function where I have these two plateaus at the top, the dark red regions that you see, and then a very sharp valley. Okay. Fine. Can you tell me how I would have come up with this kind of an error surface? What are the points that I would have chosen? Just hold on to that thought, okay? So I have this kind of an error surface, fine. Uh, the error is high on either side of the valley, right? Now, could momentum be detrimental in this case? Yes, no, maybe, I don't care. I don't care, okay. Fine, so let's see. This is the, uh, is this the 2D equivalent of that 3D surface? Everyone gets it? I can perfectly verify that you get it. Okay, everyone gets it, I'll assume, right? So these are the uh, very high plateaus where the error is very high, very sharp and narrow valley where the error is low, okay? So now again, this sorry looking black curve is what I've done with gradient descent after some 100 iterations or something. Now I'm going to run momentum based gradient descent and you have to help me in understanding what is going to happen, okay? Again, you'll soon start seeing that red curve appear. One, Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. What will happen now? It's already fast. That's no net because that black curve was after hundred iterations or so. It's fast. Now tell me what will happen. It'll go out. It's actually almost come out of the valley, right? It's almost at the top of the valley. Now what will it do? Take a U-turn. Now what will it do? Again take a U-turn. Now will keep doing this, it will take now smaller and smaller U-turns and it will converge, right? So what happens here is because of this speedy movement and which is very analogous to that car movement which I described, just overshoot your goal, you will have to take the U-turn, come back. If you are again careless, you will have to keep taking these U-turns, but you will finally end up at the location that you want to be, right? Uh, it takes a lot of U-turns before converging. Despite these U-turns, it still converges faster than gradient descent. Because gradient descent can just not move at those gentle slopes, right? It just can't move from there because the gradient is almost zero because the slope is flat, right? And it just can't move. But even with this <coughs> lot of U-turn and lot of rework, after 100 iterations, momentum-based gradient descent has reached an error of almost zero, whereas gradient descent is still stuck at the plateau at an error of 0.36. Yeah, so see, we have reached the minima now, yeah. right? And now you will be navigating there, right? But you know that now your loss is very slow, low. So you could end that, right? You know that your loss is very close to zero. So you could have a condition that once you have reached something very close to zero, you could end that. Even if you are making these very small movements now, you could just stop there. But in the plateau field, it's also But the loss is high, right? So if the loss is high and you are not moving, you cannot stop. But if the loss is low and you are not making movements, you can just stop there. Right? So you can just end, you can define that as your convergence condition, right? Okay, fine. So let's look at a, we'll come back to 3D now. Uh, we we'll look at a 3D visualization and a very different interpretation of what is happening. And I really want you to understand what exactly is happening in this uh, example which I had picked up, right? So this is what the 3D surface looks like, view from a different angle. You have these two plateaus and a very sharp valley. Now, this is the corresponding sigmoid function where I started with. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this is the sigmoid function corresponding to W equal to 6, oh no, sorry, uh, W equal to 2 and B equal to 6. This is the sigmoid function that I got once I plugged that value. So sigmoid is 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus Wx plus B. And I've plugged in the values of W and B and plotted it for all the values of X. And this is the sigmoid that I got. Okay, so that's my starting point. Is this good? How do you define good or bad? What do you expect at the end of training? It should pass through all your training points and these are my training points. Okay, is it passing through them? No, it's way off, right? Okay, so now let's start this momentum-based gradient descent 
and what just see how my sigmoid function changes okay so right now i am on the gentle slope even with momentum based gradient descent it's going to be fast but not dramatically fast because it's still building up the momentum right uh, so it's you see that these sigmoids that i'm drawing here they are almost indistinguishable from each other i've already drawn three sigmoids here so i'll just go back so there was this initial guy then i draw drew a red one then one more and then one more but they are all very close to each other now keep viewing both these sides in parallel what happens here on this figure and what happens to the sigmoid okay and i'll ask you questions so still i'm moving a bit slowly because i'm still building the momentum right it takes time to build that momentum now i've slowly started building the momentum my sigmoids have started moving towards where they should be everyone gets this what is happening here okay now tell me what will happen as i enter the valley i'm almost entering the valley what will happen i've gained this momentum now so my w comma b values are going to change much faster now so what will happen to these sigmoids they'll no longer stick to each other we'll start seeing a difference they're already moving away from each other okay so that's what's happening to the function okay now you see even faster changes okay now what will happen i have entered the valley this is how my sigmoid looks at this point now tell me what will happen it will go past what will happen to your sigma how many of you know what will happen to the sigma okay i'll i'll tell you what happens and then it will be obvious right so now i'm entering the valley all of us know that i'm going to come out of the valley of the other side right so let's see what happens when i come out of the valley from the other side the sigma it changes that's why you have this situation that your error is high on both sides right because on this side you have these kind of sigmoids on the other side you have the other sigmoids and somewhere in between lies the solution where does the solution lie at a very flat sigmoid right so now i start this is where the oscillations will happen so notice what will happen to the sigmoids they will toggle between these two orientations okay just see what happens to the sigmoids you see it again moves keeps moving keeps moving it keeps oscillating around the solution and then finally you reach the solution so you see that should i repeat this okay so when i am on one side of the valley i have one kind of sigmoids right now when i move to the other side of the valley i have this other kind of sigmoid and take a u turn so when i u turn take a u turn i again overshoot and go to the other side and this keeps happening and i keep toggling till i reach my final solution right so these are all the oscillations that you are seeing so can you visualize this what is happening do you understand how this relates to the actual function that you are trying to learn okay is this fine okay okay so that's where we'll end this module this was on momentum based gradient descent now we'll see uh, nesterov accelerated gradient descent